guys, what's up? I'm Erin and welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another episode of Open Money where we feature real people talking about their real personal financial journeys. On this episode, we are speaking with Marty. Marty, originally from the US, has decided to retire to Thailand. Good morning. Um, so my name's Marty. I uh, grew up in Connecticut, just up the coast from New York City and I uh, went to the University of Connecticut my freshman year. My parents moved to California, so I moved out there and finished at UC Berkeley and pretty much uh, stayed there for the rest of my adult life. Um, I ended up working as an engineer for uh, a Department of Energy laboratory called the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And it's funded by the Department of Energy, but it's actually operated by the University of California. So being operated means you know they pay the gardeners and the police and uh, they do purchasing but best of all they do payroll and the benefit system so i retired from the university of california and that turned out to be an un i didn't think about it when i when i joined in my 20s but it turned out to be a great thing to do for and when for did you retire so i retired in 2011 i was okay. 55 years old and uh, then in, so I had five years in the United States and five, six years in the United States. And then I had a friend actually from my first roommate from the University of Connecticut. He moved to Thailand. He had been coming here for a number of years and he decided to retire here too. And I took advantage of that and I loved it the first day. And I came out here for three month long holidays over the course of a couple of years yeah. And then just decided to move here. And I did that in 2017. So three and a half years ago, something like that. Wow. And I married. Yeah. So, so uh, married and um, we're building a house and I'm actually, uh, we've been living in Bangkok for five years, but right now I'm in the Eastern part of Thailand called Izan and I'm sitting in a hotel room. Actually, what you're looking at is the view from our house. Oh, that's so. beautiful. So it's rice fields yeah. as far as you can. That's amazing. And, That'll make for very quiet neighbors. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, there are some people who live out in the middle of a rice field. I live in the village, but okay. right on the edge of the village. And this weekend actually was uh, pretty active because uh, there was a holiday associated with the end of the rain season. And that ended up with a huge stage show and booming music at the Watt and all that kind of stuff. And then the night before last was a uh, a wedding reception that we went to. Another thing, some guy invited nine hundred people. Wow. And then, and then last night was a major holiday for uh, Thailand. It's called Loi Kutong, and it's something about paying homage to water goddesses and stuff. So you float all these little things out on the river and so on. But it's a huge holiday all over Thailand. So tonight's first quiet night in three nights. Awesome. Well, enjoy the quiet then. Do you want to start with what your numbers look like? Okay. So in terms of assets, um, I have a uh, mutual fund, Fidelity Mutual Fund, and that has 215000 in it. I have a credit union, which is 23000 and then my regular bank, which is 50000 and I um, And then I also have a Thai bank, account, which has 53,000 in it, and another joint account with my wife that's got 5,500 in it. And then I'm going to count this because it's all very recent. We bought a new car for $39,000 and the house, Oh, and, and I paid cash for that. And I can find this, but I paid cash. And the house uh, is this close to being finished. We just need a front door. Yeah. And it was 100, 100, about 120,000. Oh, wow. Involved. Very different than um, American home prices, I would say. Oh, everything about this is different. So <laughs> imagine imagine a world with with no permits mm -hmm. and you can just do anything at any time and people show up in flip flops and there's no safety or anything. About. Nobody got hurt. In yeah. fact, some of the, the workers lived on site and some of them brought their families and there were little kids running around. And yeah. as far as I know, nobody you know stepped on it. there weren't any nails it's all cement here but um mm -hmm. anyways it's kind of a different story a different world yeah. so that all adds up to about five hundred and five thousand mm -hmm. dollars which is pretty much where i was in 2011 when i retired okay so, so steady. Um, 
Yes, because, well, because okay, then we go to my income, mm -hmm. which is uh, a work pension of $7,600 a month mm -hmm. and Social Security at $2,200 a month. So that's a little over $118,000 a year. That's so, a good and both, and both of those have, as you know, uh, the Social Security has cost of living, but so does my work pension, which awesome. it might be. It might be capped at five or six percent this year because this was such a huge year. I, I vaguely remember uh, there being a cap involved, but basically I get a raise every six months because the California fiscal year is June, July 1st. And then, of course, Social Security is January 1st. That works out so. perfectly. <laughs> and then, you know, 12, 12 years of being retired, it just keeps adding up over time. Any so. debts to speak of? Pardon me? Any debts to speak of? And zero debt. Perfect. So, well, yeah. So um, I, uh, yeah, I, I pay off my credit cards every month. I always have. Yeah. And, uh, and like I said, I paid cash for the car. You can't really get a mortgage here. So I just, and, and the price was so low, I just paid cash for the house. So, yeah, I haven't had any debt for a long time. Uh, when I retired, I had a mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, I paid that off in the first three years. So that was a long time ago, back in 2014 or 2013 or something like that. So um, I haven't even had any debt since then. Could you speak to the differences between life in the US and life in Thailand? So when I first got here, I got a, oh, you want to, oh, you want to talk, okay, the differences in turn, well, let's, let's go, since the finance thing, let's go, go that. Yeah, that like, let's start with how, like, cost of living looks, and then I also want to know, like, what your life looks like in Thailand, like, what kind of, what does your yeah. life afford you? <laughs> so, so, uh, so along with all those financial numbers, <laughs> the additional financial number is um, the cost of living in Thailand, and and people, a lot of people uh, hear about, you know, places like the Philippines or Thailand or some parts of Eastern Europe and, and Central America are all um, low cost of living retirement or destinations and retirement destinations. And, and so some of what I'm going to say um, applies to all of those. But I so the first thing is I was in the San Francisco Bay Area which is a high cost of living area. Yeah. So, and then I moved to Bangkok, which was the highest cost of living in Thailand. Okay. But even here, like a big city, you get into certain parts of the city, it's really cheap. Mm -hmm. So I have a condo, I'm running a condo, it's 658 a month. Uh, internet's 22 a month, phones 25 a month, electricity 26 a month, water $6. And then there's all sorts of little things like you get a car wash and they spend 45 minutes and there's five guys working on it and it costs under $7. <laughs> you know, wow. And you do a great job. It used yeah. to cost $35, $40, $50 in, when I was in Berkeley. Wow. Um, if you eat local Thai food, my wife and I can go out and get a full breakfast, uh, two of us for like $3.70. That's so, amazing. But- and, and I'll go into the butts in a minute. So there's a what we call the the gourmet uh, markets. So mm -hmm. that's where you can buy foods that are imported and a lot of expat foods and things. So I might go in there every couple times a month and spend forty dollars. There's a there's what on the other end of the, is the Thai fresh market. So that would be like a farmers market. I think most people would would recognize it as that. They would sell. Uh, butchered meat there as well and there might be live fish there'll always be live fish and stuff but it's, it's um but but that's about sometimes fro frogs and things like turtles and things like that but anyways it's um that's like twenty dollars when we go and it's a huge thing of vegetables or meat or whatever uh burger king though is i don't know if this is i don't know what it is in america it's like 685 for a normal whopper meal is that I have not to been to a Burger King since I was probably about yeah. five years old. I don't know. <laughs> Gas is three ninety a gallon. I calculated that. Um, healthcare here is incredibly cheap mm -hmm. um, and really good. 
in fact, better than anything I had in the U.S. in two ways. Well, one, the cost, and two, just the accessibility. Yeah. Um, uh, you can. There's no waiting around for anything, and you just get right in, and you and there's no general practitioner as a gatekeeper. You yeah. just walk in and see the the cardiologist or the urologist or whatever. Oh, so wow. I, I had a, I had an emergency room visit, a kidney stone thing, um, and that whole visit was $137. That's and my, de my deductible in, in America was 150 for an emergency room. Yeah. And uh, then the next day I got to see a urologist. And I remember this, the CAT scan was that I got was $400. And I, I so I went at five o'clock in the, in the afternoon, I saw the urologist, he says, do you want a CAT scan? And we talked about it. And 30 minutes later, I'm I going up stairs and getting it so there's no yeah. like going to another building and there's no waiting huh. three days or something. and and i googled cat scan costs in america and it was somewhere like you know it's six hundred dollars or three thousand dollars depending on what you do but yeah. whatever it was, it was cheaper. but the line item for seeing the urologist that night and a couple of nurses was thirty dollars I, I can't that even was... wrap my head around that yeah. And, and same thing. I have a, I have a great dentist, mm -hmm. modern and, you know, you get your teeth cleaned by a dentist, not a dental hygienist, mm -hmm. but she's there to assistants mm -hmm. and it's very modern. And, you know, of course I had, can compare apples to apples here. Everyone's had their teeth cleaned yeah. and it's just, it's terrific. And, but I don't remember, it's probably like $20 or something like that. So it, now, it's you say the price. Do you have like Thai dental insurance and Thai medical insurance that are also paying something, or is this just okay? So let's talk insurance. Um, I when I first got here, so I I didn't cut ties so much the first year or two, just mm -hmm. kind of working my way in. But I pretty quickly realized that my U.S. insurance wasn't going to cover me here. So. Mm -hmm. It would cover me like as a traveler, probably for six months, or if I talked to them a little longer or something, but just living here full time year after year, it wasn't going to work. So I bought Thai insurance. It's actually a company that does a lot of different countries and stuff. And it is $2,000 a year. And it's a 10 million baht policy, which I, I have to do a calculation there, but so it doesn't sound much in American terms, but it's a lot here in Thailand. And um, but I also something you can do here that you can't necessarily do in America so much is I have like a thousand dollar deductible. Mm -hmm. So I, I converted all these things to dollars. So yeah. so um, the insurance is a little bit less than my U.S. insurance was, and I have a thousand dollar deductible because routine care here is so cheap mm -hmm. that I might as well pay it out of pocket. Not build up any points, you know, for having made claims and things yeah. like that. You also note that I bought it when I was 62 years old. So you're yeah. buying into an insurance policy when you're older. I'd been in the same thing at the University of California for 30 years. So mm -hmm. I have no idea how that works. So, um, uh, so, so that's, that's, what I do is I just pay routine care and things like that, um, out of pocket. And, and then I just pay this yearly thing which is basically comprehensive insurance uh, as I, well i think like my biggest concern when i look about moving abroad is health care so i mean i i love that it's great health care it's easily accessible it's affordable my other concern is language barrier do you have any issues with that so um so this is interesting for the two choices that are usually there is the Philippines versus Thailand and um, Philippines, everybody speaks a little bit of English or at least everybody under 40. Uh, in Thailand, um, it's a huge tourist country. So in the cities, in the tourist areas and stuff, you are of course going to meet people who are, um, who can speak English, let's say on a transactional basis. Mm -hmm. So if I go to the Thai fresh market here, nobody speaks English, okay. but I speak I went to Thai language school the second year I was here. So I, I, I can get by. I'm not conversational, but I can get by on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, but in a lot of things, you can you you can get away. You'll you'll get a little bit of English. Mm -hmm. um, 
And if you've, you know, anyone who's ever traveled to a foreign country, you know, you, you get by, you can buy groceries and find the toilet and get on a train and do all those sort of things. So that kind of happens, um, you know, here too. But there are also, you know, I, uh, okay, uh, let this one out. I'm a salsa dancer. So I've been salsa dancing for 20, 25 years, something like that. When I go to the, an event here in Bangkok, um, people speak fluent English. You know, okay. the Thai women fluent English there. So, uh, and Japanese and a bunch of other things. So it depends on what social strategy you're, you're in. So I'm a retiree. So I'm just dealing with like normal people. But if you were a teacher, you might go and working in an international school, everybody you know might speak English and it's taught in English. Mm -hmm. um, I know a couple of Americans who are university professors here and they teach in English. So it just kind of depends on what crowd you hang around with. So, um, so I can get on, I can get on by myself pretty well now, but I can't sit down and listen to a conversation. It doesn't work. And my wife's the same way. When I go out with our university friends, yeah. she kind of zones out because one, we're talking too fast and two, uh, they're computer science professionals. And I was an engineer and we're talking a category of vocabulary that she has no access to. Mm -hmm. So I assume you know, your wife is fluent in Thai. She's Thai and she speaks perfectly good English. Okay. But but there are uh, like normal people talking about normal stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's She's fine. But if I ask her to explain something deeper about like what I'm seeing in one of the temples, mm -hmm. she might know, but she doesn't have the English vocabulary to deal with it. Yeah. And like, we had plenty of fun with building a house because there's all sorts of discussions that go around that. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a whole new vocabulary with that as well. I mean, you know, width and length and height. And I know door window and a bunch of other things, but today we were trying to program a digital lock on the back door with the window contractor. And, and that was, you know, I, I Talk to my wife, but she didn't understand what I was saying and, yeah. and so on. So it actually got settled. It's a half conversation, <laughs> half charades. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's that. So, um, and, and Google Translate is a big help. Now, so, do you um, find that you feel like you're a part of the community? Or do you feel like you assimilate well if there's a language barrier? Because I always just, I worry about like creating that social circle and developing deep friendship. So there's two social circles. One, we are in a, village at the edge of the village and we designed this house thing and it's got it's got a uh, a kitchen building it's the kitchen is separate there's a the cooking area but there's this sort of l-shaped kind of terrace is that and normal? it's like a social outdoor kitchens are normal but a separate building not so okay. much but it's also a social center so my wife knows everybody in the village people come they sit play cards all night or something like that and if if I'm when I'm living here, we haven't moved yet, then I will make a more concerted effort mm -hmm. to talk with people. I somehow think that talking with some of the children is going to be easier for me, just practicing English. They want to practice English and I want to practice Thai. So I'll, I will go from my mediocre, passable Thai to something more conversational in terms of when I walk around the village or take a walk through the rice fields or something and I see somebody, at least I can say more than I can say now or and the other thing is understanding what they say so I don't know it, it, I'm pretty sensitive to um like when I speak English to somebody who for which English is a second language I try to keep the vocabulary and the idioms down and stuff but other people don't do that mm -hmm. they just start rattling off like you're another person and and I'm not going to understand slang. I'm not going to understand that idiom or or anything. I've got to tone it down. I have to learn how to say, talk to me like a five-year-old. Yes. And, and I do actually know how to say something like that. <laughs> so, um, you know, use, speak slowly and use simple words. Then I, and I might, I might be able to understand you. So, and then we're also near the Cambodian border and Izan has its own dialect. Mm -hmm. So I try not to listen in on conversations too much because they're probably speaking Izan and I don't want to, even go down that path yeah <laughs> too many so. languages at once <laughs> so yeah. uh okay so the second community though is other expats mm -hmm. so 
even here, kind of in the middle of farm country, um, there are places, there are a lot of other, well, not a lot, but, you know, let's say there's a hundred Westerners in the area. Oh. Now, they're not all Americans. There might be, there's a lot of English and New Zealanders. There's a lot of Swedes and Danes, uh, you know, all kinds of people. But um, uh, you can, you know, there are bars and there are restaurants and things that are where people gather. Like I just found one place that uh, it's it's a very nice establishment and it's got great food and it's own. It's run by a Thai wo woman and her husband is from New Zealand. And so we sat and talked for the evening. So a very um, popular place to retire. Thailand? Yeah. Oh my God. Huge. Really? I, I had no idea. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, because it's in that, if you, you go through YouTube and, and you look for low cost of living countries, mm -hmm. there's that whole, that there's that whole group and, the popular ones are the Philippines and Thailand. Uh, then you get the Central America, you get Mexico and yep. uh, Panama, Ecuador and all that kind of stuff. And then there's a whole bunch of the Portugal is a biggie. And then you start getting into Slovenia and, and some of these other Eastern things. And they're all kind of in a, a dozen countries or so that, that are popular. I'm, I'm imagining Central America is more popular than the Southeast Asia, but Southeast Asia is huge. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot of expats here. There's a couple hundred thousand, I'm sure, oh. maybe maybe half a million. Now, but I mean, that's that's people who, that's people who over the last thirty years yeah. have come and stayed. We do yeah. that sort of thing, but yeah, it's, it's huge. Now, during your working years, did you think about retire retiring abroad? I didn't think about retiring at all, but. Oh, okay. um, I mean, when you're 20 and you, I, well, for one thing, I, I worked in the same place for 30 years mm -hmm. and I sort of told myself if, if I, um, as long as I'm having fun, I'll just keep working. Yeah. And so, um, so, you know, in your 20, 24 or something like that, I joined this laboratory and then I was just going. And, uh, at the time I retired, I, I sort of looked back and I decided, you know, out of 30 years, I had only had three bad years the last one being one of the bad ones, but That's I thought that was a pretty good record. So, you know, people who know me would never have thought that I would like give it up. I was, I was an engineer in a national laboratory. First half of my career was sort of environmental prote protection agency projects, uh, building equipment for air pollution. But the second half was the better half. And that was, um, providing the engineering support for DNA sequencing laboratories. So there was this thing called the Human Genome Project, which was 15, 20 years ago. And there were five labs involved with that around the world. And we were one of them. And so I was the engineering manager for that. And that was just a lot of fun. I mean, I started out in biology at the University of Connecticut. So it kind of came full circle here. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, nobody would have thought I'd want to do it. But this is a story going all the way back to Henry Ford technology came along and it changed. Mm -hmm. So the technology that came, I mean, we we had a laboratory with a hundred sequencing machines, which in a couple of years went down to six. Okay. And so, so you go from a department of 60 people to six, something yeah. like that. So it's a huge downsizing thing. It was a miserable, miserable year. And so I'll go into my retirement decision. Uh, after about six to eight months of this misery of downsizing, I wasn't in any particular danger because I had 30 years of mm -hmm. performance appraisals and things that uh, to back me up, but it was just life wasn't fun anymore. So I decided to look at the University of California, my, my benefits thing. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the number of what I would get, I like instantly knew that that was a eureka moment because I always did the monthly bills at home and I knew exactly what that number meant. Yeah. It meant it was really close to what I was already living on. Okay. So between payroll taxes and the huge amount of money I was putting into my retirement thing, um, I knew what this number meant. So that was like the beginning of June in 2010. And I went home and I started making a spreadsheet. So I'm an engineer, so I know project management mm -hmm. and I know how to make a project task list. And I know you can't have too little detail detail or it doesn't tell you anything. And if you have too much detail, it's a mess. Yeah. So I know how to do that. And I, 
I started making, and, and I'm also not one of those people that kept a meticulous budget for all my life. I Life was pretty much the same. And so every month was the same and it wasn't okay. a problem. Yeah. So I, I didn't keep a, a detailed budget until I got to this spreadsheet. And then I started putting what I needed to put down there. And I ran it out like 12 years because I had a, um, uh, my mortgage was three more years. And then social security, which is either 62 or 65, whatever you, so you make your spreadsheet to go out there. And then of course you can futz with it in terms of in, inflation and raises and cost of living increases and that sort of thing. Anyways, I started working on it. And by the end, by 4th of July weekend, it wasn't changing anymore. And every time it changed anyway, it kept getting better. Okay. So, um, so it's amazing when you don't put money into savings anymore and you don't pay payroll taxes, suddenly what you need is a lot less than because yeah. you're already living a, a much less of a paycheck. So by 4th of July, it didn't um, change anymore. And I just said, I'm ready. I can do this. But I decided to wait a couple of months and let it marinate and see what I felt like later because in September I start hearing about changes um, that are coming for the coming year because the federal date is October 1st. That's when they their fiscal year starts. So we start hearing about changes in September. September came along and it wasn't going to work for me. So I just walked into my boss and I said, I'm going to uh, retire. She said, fine. And I picked mid-December to leave work it's the slowest two months of my life, just getting from September to mid-December. Yeah. And then um, my official date was March 1st, because I ran out nine and a half weeks of, of holiday vacation time. And I kept accruing two days a month yep. for Christmas, New Year's, and President's Day, and all that kind of stuff. So anyways, March 1st on 2011, I left. But it was it was a a quick decision. There was no sitting around with a five-year plan, you know, counting down the days or anything. It was like, I was kind of miserable. And one day I looked at the retirement thing and, you know, 40 days later, I said, I, I can do this. The number said you could. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, and I wasn't, I hadn't been looking at them because I was in my fifties. Why, why would I look at my retirement thing? So, and so um, you take a trip to Thailand, a couple trips, right? Yeah. Three. And you decide to move from California to Thailand. I, I mean, do you miss California? Like, I, I don't know how, how that decision came about. So, um, no, I don't okay. miss California uh, or the United States in general. I, 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 wanna, I like to put it this way because I don't want to be negative about things. It's... Um, I spent 60 years in the United States and I found a place that looked interesting and I was just kind of moving on. It's not mm -hmm. a question of having regrets yeah. from was or, or that I didn't, it's not like I don't like the United States. It's mm -hmm. that I found another place. Mm -hmm. So that's actually kind of a, a thing that bugs a lot of people, especially back in America. You know, they think the very fact that you've moved overseas is somehow a rejection of America, but they take it personally or whatnot. But what it really comes down to is that there are other good places in the world. Mm -hmm. They're good in different ways. And you have to make a lot of adjustments and, and be of the right mindset to see it that way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not like America is not is the best place on earth and the only good place on earth. It's that it's a great place uh, for a lot of reasons, but it's not the only good place. And uh, you can go and be equally happy in, a, in other places. And there's also another thing that comes up. There's a lot, you know, everybody knows that everyone wants to come to America. But a lot of people who are, most of the people in that category are people looking for economic opportunity. Now, whether it's someone coming across the Texas border or a young college graduate from London, they're coming here because of the, uh, you know, the dynamic economy. And it, you can get jobs and you can create jobs and you can advance and you can make more money. I mean, there's a lot of, well, at least in my generation, a lot of ways to do that. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a whole different thing. Now it's a lot more um, gig economy type stuff and so on. But uh, in any case, 
it is still the land of economic opportunity. So people who are, whether you're from a war zone or from Paris or London, where, you know, the employment thing might be kind of stifling for you, um, you know, America is a great place to come to. But if you're a retired, I've done that. You know, mm-hmm. I played that game. I won, hopefully. And so I don't think of it in those terms. I like I just need a fun, relaxing place to be. And by those standards, America, you know, is on a level playing field with the rest of the world. Yeah. And and I'll tell you, that, like, San Francisco, um, certainly from you're in Rhode Island, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah it's, you get snow. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I was from Connecticut. But I'm originally from California. Michigan. I am very familiar with snow. <laughs> but so so you're going to laugh at this, but I was retired in my little ha- house with a one floor heater in, in mm-hmm. East Bay of San Francisco. And I was just cold, you know, at, at, during when I was working, I would go mm-hmm. at home. But now I'm home all day and the fog rolls in at five o'clock. You can't sit outside at night. Um, and. I just got tired of it. You know, it rain, the rainy season is from November to March and that's when it's cold and rainy and fog. And I came to Thailand and it's just hot. I mean, it's hot and very hot. Yeah. And I love being outside at night. My entire wardrobe is, is t-shirts, cargo shorts and sandals. And, okay. you know, the coldest place, first coldest place I encounter are like movie theaters, okay. you know, with the air conditioning. And so you know, as a retiree, I also sweat and yeah. I would never have wanted to be here when I was working. Yeah. I mean, who wants to like go out for lunch and sweat up a storm and then have to go back and maybe change clothes or, or whatever? That would have been miserable. But as a retiree, you just buy the right clothes and you, you just walk slow and you do, you know, so you can adjust your life to hot. And I so much more appreciate it now than I would have or than I ever would have in my working years. So it's a retiree perspective there um, as well. So you said your pension's around $100,000 a year. I feel like that would provide a pretty nice life in America because that's a, still a pretty great income. Does it provide an amazing life in Thailand? Okay, so I mentioned before that these countries are known from the for the low cost of living thing. So mm-hmm. there's, a, there's a huge interest among people who are like living on just their social security. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, they're looking for someplace they can afford to. But at the end of the day, your money goes just as far here. I mean, money goes far for everyone of every income level. Okay. So, um, so, so social security recipients not going to spend $120,000 on a house. They probably mm-hmm. haven't, uh, you know, even saved up that much money. Um, they might have, I'm not trying to offend anyone, <laughs> but uh, but there are plenty of well-to-do expats here. So I go to a place in Bangkok and there's a little, it's a kind of restaurant bar area and they have an ex, what I call the expat table. And uh, I've met um, people with families, people who work for the U.S. Embassy, they go there. I've met uh, a couple of people who are retirees from oil companies. So they were like the in the finance department for 30 years or some American oil company in Thailand or some Western oil company in Thailand. And they're, they're, you know, they're as well. I mean, they had a professional salary like I did, and I don't know how many pensions versus savings and stuff, but anyways, they're wealthy people. One guy a, was a professional poker player and he's, he's still working and he has a huge income. He, he just rented a condo. It's a two story condo with three bedrooms. It's a little on the older side, but it's really nice. And it has its own private swimming pool. Wow. And so, I'm sure, I don't know if you can get something like that in America, but, but I'm sure it's, it's, you know, a lot more affordable. So, um, you know, my condo in Bangkok, six fifty um, a month now, probably be way over 2000 in San Francisco or even in the San Francisco Bay area. So everything goes further and you can, and places like Bangkok and Pattaya and Jom Tien have, uh, a huge food scene, expensive restaurant, you know, Western prices is what I would say. So one of the, one of the things that can catch you here as an expat, if you come from America and you decide you're just going, you're looking for a cheaper place to live, but you're going to like create a bubble uh, and reproduce your American life here, you'll end up buying only imported products and spend, maybe have a nicer residence 
but you know it won't be that much cheaper because you're 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 buying expensive clothes and you're buying expensive food and and going to expensive restaurants yeah and then another funny, another funny thing my rent is one of the biggest things in all these low cost of living countries is the lower cost of housing so my house is pretty inexpensive when you add it all up <laughs> and my rent is pretty inexpensive but i came from california where i had paid off my mortgage mm-hmm. so I come to Thailand and now I have a housing expense I didn't have when I was in California. Yeah. And a lot of people in their 60s are going to be in that category. Mm-hmm. So when you're making that decision to come here and whether it's cheaper or not, you need to, you really need to change up your life or be will, wanting to and willing to change up your life and have a positive perspective about that. So, um, and and the whole thing about owning a house kind of is flipped on, it's flipped around because the, the economics of owning a house almost don't make any sense if rent is so cheap. Yeah. I mean, it's just like suddenly it doesn't, isn't that important. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, there's things like that. So it's uh, when it comes to food, I say I, I eat 80% Thai and, you know, 20% Western and I eat 50% out and 50% we cook at home because eating out is almost cheaper than uh, cooking. I mean, mm-hmm. that, three dollar and 70 cent meal i talked about how do you beat it much cheaper. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's much yeah. cheaper to go out and, and do that yeah. and eat out so, so there's um it's uh you you have to come and you have to adapt to the culture you can't just be come here and just reproduce america or england or whatever you have to change up your life quite a bit and you have to realize what you're leaving behind i mean i was fine with leaving i didn't have I have a, a a 92 year old mom in a assisted living facility and I have my sister living near her, but lots of people won't or can't do this because they're either taking care of their parents or um, they want to be in the same time zone. So that's why a lot of people go to Central America or they, you know, they just have sentimental ties and things. They don't want to leave family. They don't want to leave grandkids or something like that. So I've had a couple of lucky things, though, that, that also helped me out. One, I've never had children. Mm-hmm. Two, I've never been unemployed. I got a job with a great pension. I've had no medical events in my life. And my parents were prepared for retirement. So, you know, my mother's in this assisted living facility, but all off her own money. Yeah. So, you know, I haven't had setbacks. Yeah. Uh, that are, you know, pretty frequent among people and mm-hmm. so on. So, you know, I didn't have any of that holding me back. I uh, didn't have anything holding me back in the middle of my career like that. Mm-hmm. No restarts or anything. I started at 24 or whatever and just went up from there. Yeah. That's interesting that you say that. Like, I, you kind of broke down all the major ones. I'm glad you never had any of them. I didn't really like think about them, but even thinking about the list, I'm like, I've had a handful of those. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else you want to add? Um, so the other thing that kind of helped, I mean, part about re- part of the retirement thing is to live below, live below your means mm-hmm. and the whole fire movement and things like that. So I'll say, yeah, pay off your credit cards every month. Um, the only two debts I ever had were house mortgage and how and cars. And uh, you just pay modest on those, you know, don't buy the most expensive car. You don't have to buy the cheapest one. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would pay half for a car and finance the other half for three years. And when the three years were up, whatever that payment was, I would just put it in the bank for the next car. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always paying stuff for that. You save up for vacations. You don't take a vacation, then pay it off. Yeah. Um, and uh, and the usual save uh, start saving early, get in the habit. And and the best thing is if you can get if you're have a payroll, get payroll deductions and have it put into an account that you don't draw from. You just put money in, just out of sight, out of mind. You know, if it's fifty dollars a month, that's fine. If it's three hundred dollars a month, that's fine. Just have it go straight to a savings account that you never touch. And, you know, 20 years later, you're going to look at it and whether it's a savings account or some kind of investment, you know, mutual fund thing, just don't, don't look at it and just do it. Maybe one day you can look at it and then decide to retire 40 days later. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I think if you're, if you're, of course, pensions are not mm -hmm. common now. Mm -hmm. They are in, obviously, government workers, military, apparently universities, things like there's, there are places where, where it does, but um, you probably do have to pay attention to investing. I was a terrible investor. I knew not, I never got it. So I was a good saver though. Yeah. And, and then whatever you end it's and then whatever you end up, you have to have a positive attitude. You have to be happy with what you've got as opposed to wishing you had more. 100% agree with that one. Absolutely. If you're grateful for what you have, you kind of have an easier time at life, I think. I And I also found that I, and I hear this a lot online, I end up spending less. I mean, I made that spreadsheet, but I ended up spending, especially the first year, spending a lot less than I thought I would. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, you know, people imagine they're going to uh, join golf clubs or imagine they're going to travel around the world. And yeah, you travel and you do some things, but it's never, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be that much. So I, a lot of people find out they spend less than they, they had planned on it. I hear that from people too. Very rarely do I hear people say, oh, I spent more than I expected when I retired. So yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. I enjoy your channel. Thank you. Bye-bye. Would you ever consider retiring abroad? If so, where would you go? Let me know your thoughts in a comment down below. If you want to be part of the Open Money series, I would love to feature you. Talk about your perspective on money, your income, budget, net worth, you name it, we can feature it. All you have to do is send me an email at erintalksmoney at gmail.com and we will get it set up. I post new videos every single week. If you got anything at all at this one, please give it a like. If you're new here, please consider subscribing or if you know of someone who might get something out of this type of content, please consider sharing. I hope you have a good one. I'll see you soon. Bye.